when the Buddha taught tranquility and insight. He didn't teach them as two separate techniques. There are two qualities of mind that you try to develop as you're getting the mind into concentration. Like right now, you're trying to stay with the breath, to settle in, have a sense of ease with the breath. That's tranquility. But as the Buddha said, when he gives breath meditation instructions, you're trying to look at the breath as bodily fabrication and your feelings and perceptions around the breath as mental fabrication. And it's seeing things in terms of fabrication. That's insight. And for the time being, we're not watching them just arising and passing away. We're trying to give rise to good fabrications and hasten the passing away of ones that are not skillful. When the Buddha talks about discernment being penetrative insight into a rising and passing away, it's not just passively watching things come and watching things go. One, he says that this insight is penetrative. And when he talks about penetrative, you're trying to see what's skillful, what's not skillful. What has an effect on what? In other words, what's the cause, what's an effect? And what are good causes and what are bad causes? Because as he goes on to say, it leads to the right ending of stress and suffering. And that requires that you know what to do with things as they arise and pass away. Some things, when they arise, you want to abandon them because they're unskillful. Other things, when they arise, they they're good, they're skillful, so you want to encourage them, develop them. If they're not there yet, you try to give rise to them. So it's not like you're stepping back and just watching these things happening. You try to play a role and figure out which ones you want to encourage and which ones you don't. Right now you want to encourage the arisings of whatever is going to give rise to a good state of concentration, maintain your concentration. and discourage whatever's going to destroy it. All of this is the work of insight. On the one hand, you're constructing a state of concentration out of fabrication. And as for things that would come in and destroy your concentration, you want to deconstruct those. That's what the word visankara means in Pali. Sometimes that's translated as the unfabricated, but it's not. And that passage where the Buddha talks about seeing the, the house builder. He says, you're in, engaged in deconstruction, sankara. That's how you come to the end of craving. So you get the mind still, make it tranquil, and then see what's going to come in to dest destroy that tranquility. Sometimes the things that are going to destroy it come from outside, like pain. comes in and invades, and you have to deal with it. And here you're trying to deconstruct. What is it about the pain that invades the mind? We're not here to make the pain go away. We're here to understand why does it invade the mind and remain. And you find that's a state of becoming that gets developed around the pain, you as the victim of the pain. And you want to learn how to take that apart. So you see where there's the pain, which part of the experience is the body, which part is the actual pain, and which part is the perception. If you look at this in terms of the establishing some mindfulness, you've got body, feelings, feelings, mind. And then middle qualities, in which case the middle qualities here might be the five aggregates. How are you using the five aggregates to put together your experience of pain? You start out by focusing on the pain itself, but then you begin to realize the pain is not so much the problem. The problem is the perceptions and the thought constructs that go around it. How you talk to yourself about the pain, the images you have in mind about the pain, how it's invaded your space and how you're being oppressed by it. 
and then our mind starts sending messages back and forth into the past and the future. Into the past it starts talking about how long the pain has been there, how much you can't stand it. And then in the future it sends its warnings, watch out, there's a pain here. And that perception shapes your next moment of consciousness, then your next moment, and your next moment, and drags them down, fastens them into the pain. You want to watch out for that. Learn how to take that apart. Because it's the perception that makes the pain invade the mind. There's an instance of using your powers of insight to take things apart that would otherwise destroy your concentration. At that moment, actually, the, the pain itself becomes the topic of your concentration, and you're working on the insight together. If the work of insight starts getting blurry, you can't deconstruct things properly. Then you try to go back to the breath, protect it, say, this is my area. Hold that perception in mind. Let the pain have something else. If it's too much to bear, it's destroying your concentration, okay, move. But otherwise, see if you can stay here with the pain. Because again, the purpose is not so much to make the pain go away. It's to say, why does it invade the mind? Other times when there's not much pain, everything seems to settle down fine. Then you can ask yourself after the mind is rested, what in here is still disturbing the concentration? In here you're not so much looking for disturbances from outside, you're looking for disturbances that the mind is creating itself. I mean, the classic example is getting the mind to settle down, you've got to talk to it. You evaluate the breath, think about the breath, evaluate the breath. You think about your mind, evaluate your mind, see how you might be able to fit them together. And then when the fit is snug, you don't have to do so much talking anymore. But our minds are chatterboxes. Once you start talking, we can't stop. We get carried away listening to the sound of our inner voice. You've got to remind yourself, you don't need that here. That's actually a, a disturbance. And there's a sense of self that's going to be associated with that inner voice, and it's going to get upset. Why don't you want me? And the answer is, we don't need you. Just try to be with the breath. Zero in on it and try to be one with the breath. So here again, you're constructing, you're putting things together. And you find yourself going back and forth, protecting the mind, getting it more settled in, and then trying to understand whatever the disturbances are. Take those apart. And then put together again what you got left. So you're going back and forth like this. And John Lee's image is of a person walking you. You alternate your left foot and your right foot, then your left foot, then your right foot. You don't go hopping down the road on just one foot and say, when do I get to insight so I can change my foot? They go back and forth like this. And as you get better and better deconstructing the disturbances and shifting your focus on the, on the disturbances outside to the disturbances inside, that's where you see that insight does a lot of its real work, taking apart the, the mind that's doing the concentration. That too has its form and feelings and perceptions and thought constructs and consciousness. The fact that the mind in concentration is the ideal laboratory for understanding these things and taking them apart. But the voices in the mind, you find there are many layers. There's the mind, or the voice in the mind that tries to take charge, and then the other voices that make comments on it, and then there are the voices that make comments on the comments. And you see what you can do to take them apart. Because as the Buddha said, in other places, in addition to seeing things arising and passing away, you want to see them as separate. 
And those are two sides of the same coin. Because once you've got the mind in a state, either a state of concentration or any emotion, it's in a state of becoming. And as the Buddha said, once you're in a state of becoming, if you try to destroy it, that's craving for non-becoming. You try to maintain it, and it's craving for becoming. So what do you do? Well, you try to see how the next becoming is getting put together. That's where the work of dismantling or deconstruction comes in. The work of seeing things as separate as they arise and pass away. So you can develop a sense of dispassion for those raw materials from which that state of becoming gets formed. So whether it's a becoming that's a distraction or the becoming of concentration itself, you understand the inner workings, things that come prior to becoming. As the Buddha says, you see what has come to be simply as what has come to be, and then you allow it to pass away. And that's how you get beyond the concentration. But in the meantime, you've got to work on it. And protect it. So your construction and deconstruction will deal mainly with keeping the concentration constructed and deconstructing any disturbances, wherever you find them. And sometimes the map of the jhanas will give you some good ideas about where you might want to look for the disturbance. Is the disturbance directed thought and evaluation? Is the mind oppressed by the sense of rapture? Where is the disturbance? And see what's causing it. The purpose being that you get more subtle in your ability to take things apart. Because you see that when they arise, there are different events arising that you've glommed together. Again, as with the pain. There are little moments of pain. We tend to glom together and glom them together into one big block of pain. And it's located right there at that spot in your body. And it's invaded that spot in the body. And so in telling yourself the story about the pain, you've already made it into a kind of becoming. So you've got to take it apart. Okay, what exactly are the pain sensations? What are the perceptions that you use for the pain sensations? Do they rise and fall away at the same time? Are they separate events? When they arise, are they coming at you? Are they going away? Try to do what you can to make sure they, they don't come in and invade. You keep this up as long as you have the energy to deal with it and see things as distinct. When st things start getting blurry and it's hard to make the distinction, when you go back to your concentration, just rest for a while. And this way you keep walking left, right, left, right. And these two qualities help each other along. So remember, it's not just a matter of still, 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 and then insight, 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 arising, passing away, arising, passing away. The mind is a lot more complex than that. And if you make your concentration practice a complete practice with insight and tranquility, helping the concentration along, protecting it when needed to protect it, reconstructing it when it starts falling apart. Your insight into arising and passing away does get penetrative, because you begin to see what works, what doesn't work, what's helpful, what's not helpful. When you start making distinctions like that, that's when you can apply the teachings of the Four Noble Truths.
is that different events in the mind do have their duties, and the Four Noble Truths are there to remind you what, of what the duties are. With the aggregates, your duty is to comprehend them. That means understanding to the point where there's no passion, aversion, or delusion around them. Your duty with regard to the craving that would lead you to be passionate about these things. You can try to abandon that. As for anything that's good, that's helpful in the path, okay, that's something you try to develop. So the path will take you to where you want to go. I was listening to a Dharma talk the other day where the speaker was saying that the end of suffering is nothing really remarkable. It's simply when you've had a problem in the mind and then the problem has been solved and there's that moment of release, spaciousness, rest. He was advising that you learn how to appreciate that, because that's, that's what the Buddha was talking about. Which is underselling the Buddha pretty badly. As he said, the total, total dispassion, without trace, total letting go. That's what we're after. He says, when you see the goal, you've seen the deathless. You haven't seen just a moment of ah. It's a lot more impressive than that. So we are going to a good place this way. And it requires that as we walk along, we use both feet, both legs, alternating insight, tranquility, insight, tranquility. You can't hop your way to nirvana. To learn how to walk with some skill. <laughs>